genre is known as a dark genre. It's nihilistic, bleak, grim, grotesque, without hope or positive outlook. Horror endings in particular tend to twist the knife. In Nosferatu, the girl dies. In the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, the hero is revealed to be insane. In the ring, the only way to survive is to pass the curse on to someone else. In the mist, salvation comes just a few seconds too late. At least in the Night of the Living Dead, the hero survives the zombie onslaught. But then he's promptly shot in the head. Good shot. Perhaps horror is a truly dark genre. But is this really the case? Is horror really as nihilistic and grim as it seems on the surface? Let's take a historical perspective as we look for an answer. This is The Haunted Castle, the first horror film ever made. It is a trick film, as much there to amaze audiences as to scare them. Once films started developing narratives, horror cinema generally pulled its punches. In The Avenging Conscience, adapted from Edgar Allan Poe's short story The Telltale Heart, director D.W. Griffith chose not to go with Poe's original ending. In Poe's short story, a killer is driven mad by the phantom heartbeat of an old man he murdered. In Griffith's film adaptation, it is all a dream, complete with a happy ending. However, bleakness soon ensued in the horror field, courtesy of the Germans. In the film The Plague of Florence, very loosely adapted from Edgar Allan Poe's The Mask of Red Death, a plague wipes out most of the Florentine population, and in the end, all we're left with is a vista of corpses. Later German horror films further highlighted grim atmospheres. Though honestly, Germany had little to be happy about at the time. They'd just lost a world war, and they'd been royally screwed at the Versailles Treaty, leaving the country in destitution and forcing the nation and its people to take full responsibility for the war. This caused a lot of bitterness among Germans, and using said bitterness, along with an economic collapse, extreme nationalists stoked the anger of the German people, bringing the already underlying anti-Semitism in the country to a boiling point. Nazis got a foothold in German politics, and soon, the world was at war yet again. Certainly, Earth was no picnic before the Second World War, but the brutality of the conflict and its visibility through modern media and national propaganda radically changed culture in the West. Before the Second World War, horror was often somewhat mild. In the horror cinema of that era, the monster would turn out to be a gangster in disguise, as seen in The Cat in the Canary, or the threat would be a murderous yet far from bulletproof ape, as in Murders in the Rue Morgue, or the bad guy would be foiled by a comedic hero such as in The Monster. Sure, there were plenty of great horror films that had serious fright scenes, but these were usually monster movies such as Frankenstein or King Kong or snarky pre-code thrillers such as Mystery of the Vax Museum and Dr. X. More serious topics were treated lightly. For instance, in Dr. X, a serial murderer turns out to be a scientist run amok, perhaps the most typical villain of the era. It was always a mad scientist, always someone challenging the status quo with dangerous yet quaint experiments. While the killer in Dr. X is creepy, 
He is easily outdone by a bumbling reporter. And so it usually went. Only occasionally would horror films truly go dark, like in The Black Cat, where war crimes and obsession go hand in hand in a portrait of human bleakness. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do to you now. Fell the skin from your body. <laughs> Following the war, there was a shift. The films got more grim. Producer Val Luton had made several handsome and haunting horror films during the war, films that relied on a grim and moody atmosphere. Luton also produced one of the first horror films released after the end of World War II. Is that you? Isle of the Dead premiered September 7, 1945, merely five days after Japan officially signed their declaration of surrender aboard the USS Missouri. Isle of the Dead is a bleak film about madness and the plague. It follows a journalist and a general who find themselves quarantined on a Greek cemetery island. Soon, the local custodian and his guests begin dying. Isle of the Dead was inspired by the Arnold Bocklin painting of the same name. The haunted spectral atmosphere of the picture spells out the sense of doom and despair. Director Mark Robson expertly transferred the mood from canvas to screen. This was only the first couple of steps into the dark journey horror films would soon take. Yet in the two decades immediately following the war, the onslaught of science fiction films cut the feet out from under the horror genre. Fewer horror films were produced, while more kid-friendly sci-fi flicks ruled the genre box office. However, during this period, the few horror films made began exploring darker themes, and they grew more violent to boot. Even some of the science fiction films adopted bleaker outlooks, like the downbeat Invasion of the Body Snatchers from 1956. Here In the West, kids born after the war became the first generation of modern teenagers, rebelling against their still traumatized parents, and more importantly, against injustices in a society where racism, misogyny, and inequality reigned. These kids lived in a world where nuclear annihilation was a button push away, and if they were French, or later on American, they were drawn into a brutal and meaningless war in Vietnam. Their escape was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was counterculture. With the ever-increasing interest in cinema, and with the advent of film theory courses at universities and fan magazines such as Famous Monsters of Filmland, some of these kids became filmmakers, and they were keenly watching contemporary horror filmmakers break the mold. No longer under the shackles of the Hayes Code, gore fiends like Herschel Gordon Lewis began making ultra-violent content for small specialty markets. In England, Hammer films took traditional British storytelling and spiced it up by adding sex and violence. In Italy, Mario Bava explored eroticism in horror, remixing genres as he saw fit. Then, this new generation began making films, inspired by the rule breakers challenging the old ways. The new generation was not shy about communicating how bleak they felt the world had become. Pittsburgh-based commercial producer George A. Romero stunned horror fans with Night of the Living Dead, a film that's credited with reinventing the zombie as a modern movie monster. Before Romero's film, the zombies were racist depictions of brain-dead, usually ethnic husks, controlled by a wicked master, as seen in White Zombie or Zombies on Broadway. Now they were flesh-eating ghouls, no longer connected to Caribbean lore. Not to be outdone, former academic Wes Craven let loose with The Last House on the Left, a thoroughly brutal and relentless revenge thriller that was as much inspired by the cinema of Ingmar Bergman as it was by the relentless political turmoil seen in the world at the time. And the quiet and introverted Toby Hooper made the in-your-face horror classic The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He intended it to be darkly funny, but mostly, horror fans were simply shocked by the astounding brutality of the film. Horror films were no longer escapist entertainment for adventuresome children and teenagers. The films were now adult and the horror genre had become a barometer of its time. 
horror reflected the bleak political landscape that arose post-World War II. People were used to their world being brutal, no longer sheltered. Worldwide brutality could be seen at home on TV. In short, horror needed to be dark to properly reflect the world and to serve as an outlet for frightened and frustrated audiences. That answers the question. Yes, horror needs to be dark and grim and bleak and nihilistic. But that's not the full picture. It doesn't explain the presence of lighter horror fare, such as tremors, oh, what the hell's going on? or Odd Thomas, even in death, we still have a pathetic need to be liked, or Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, ah! Ah! or any time Abbott and Costello met some kind of monster. These lighter horror films never went away just because the horror genre became grim and dark. Come and get it, you undead sack of shit. I think the reason is simple enough. If horror can reflect the darkness of society, then it can also reflect the gentler side of humanity. We humans need our thrills and our scares. And we also need reassurance. Good guys can beat the monsters. Broke into the wrong goddamn rec room, didn't you, you bastard? Before you cynics out there say that is not true to life, I offer you civilization as proof to the opposite. Without cooperation, kindness and empathy, we'd still be stuck in the Stone Age beating each other over the heads with rocks. Yes, there are so many things that are bad about our lives, but there are so many things that are good. The horror genre shows us countless samples of this. Sometimes horror tales end well, and sometimes they don't. In The People Under the Stairs, the young hero survives and endures by standing up to the monstrous villains. He chooses to fight for others, and it pays off in the end. Bombs away. No! When heroes win, it is usually because they chose a civilized and life-affirming path. This is why the ending in the otherwise pitch perfect The Cabin in the Woods never rang true to me. We humans sacrifice ourselves for each other. In this ending, the heroes inherently do not. Instead, they let the world end for the sake of a nihilistic attitude. You were right. Humanity. I believe in society. I believe in civilization. I believe in us helping each other. And most of you out there do too. Why are you doing this to us? Because you were home. Very few genuine nihilists exist. And that's because we are social creatures. We fight for each other and we fight against injustice. Yes, we often fail. And there are a lot of selfish shit heels out there. We work through the frustrations they cause using brilliant films like The Thing and Last House on the Left to work through our feelings of nihilism and hopelessness. But here's the thing, we also often win. Stupid son bitch. Knocked itself cold. That's where equally brilliant, but far more pleasant horror films like Tremors and Tucker and Dale vs. Evil demonstrate our ability to overcome our worst terrors together. And then there's everything in between, where goodness overcomes horror through self-sacrifice, like in The Exorcist. It is bleak, but yet at the same time hopeful and spiritual. From the dawn of horror cinema until today, the horror genre has taken the temperature of the zeitgeist. Yeah, no. It has reflected us, it has sought to answer questions about us, it has challenged us, mocked us, despaired for us, and hoped for us. Horror needs to be bleak. Horror needs to be hopeful. It is too versatile a genre to be any one singular thing. So enjoy the glory and the despair of horror cinema, because it captures us so well.
My name is Wolfcraft. This is History of Horror. If you liked the episode, I'd sure appreciate it if you liked, shared, and subscribed. Also, if you want to check out some of my other works, I'm an author. My science fiction novel, God of Desolation, is currently available on Amazon. And my upcoming urban fantasy and mystery novel, Richly Drawn, will be available on Inkshares.com in 2022. It's been pushed back a few months due to the ongoing complications on the publishing industry due to COVID, but it will come out soon enough. Thanks a plenty.